Okay. 
Hello, hello. Good morning. Bom dia. Shall we start? Okay. Well, welcome to Brazil from bad to worse since COP26, an event organized by Global Canopy in partnership with Greenpeace and People's Palace Projects. I am Yula Horsch. I'm a journalist and a communications manager at People's Palace Projects, and now we'll be the moderator of the event, which is also part of the London Climate Action Week. Welcome also to everyone with us online. Muito obrigada aos que nos assistem online. Brazil and Brazilians, in particular environmental defenders and indigenous people, have been suffering from multiple crises a political crisis, an economic, economic crisis, a social crisis, an ethical crisis, and as consequence of them all, an unprecedented environmental crisis. Currently, 125 million Brazilians, more than half of the population, live with some degree of food insecurity. And of these, 33 million are hungry today. The number of people living in Hungary in Brazil has surged 73% in the past two years, a historic setback. Brazil's inflation hit its highest since 2003, and approximately 12 million people are unemployed in the country, in addition to many millions of precarious and informal workers. The national public debt reached $1.1 trillion by the end of last year. With five months to go, before Brazil's presidential election, far-right president Jair Bolsonaro faces possible defeat. And he and his allies have been frequently casting doubt on the integrity of Brazil's polls, pointing to the possibility of fraud and intensifying push for military support in case he is not re-elected. Connected with and part of all of these problems, the deforestation of the Amazon remains at record levels growing now in some of the most well-preserved parts of the forest, and not only around the arc of deforestation. According to Amazon data, an area equivalent to more than 2,000 football pitches of the Amazon rainforest is destroyed every day. Every day. Brazil is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be an environmental defender, as we all know by now, and one with the highest number of land conflicts. According to Comissão Pastoral da Terra data, 19 people were killed in Brazil until May this year, only this year, a number that does not include the horrendous murder of Dom Phillips and Bruno Pereira at Vale do Javari. That shocked us all. Or of the indigenous Guarani Kaiowa Vitor Fernandes killed last Friday. Today we are here to listen to what has happened to Brazil since COP26 from Chai Surui the young Brazilian indigenous activist from the Amazon forest, the state of Rondonia, who spoke at the opening ceremony at COP26 in Glasgow. And we are here to discuss with Shai and our panelists what can be done to break this destructive cycle in Brazil, how to turn the strong commitments on forests at COP26 into action, and how the finance sector can contribute and progress on their deforestation-free portfolio commitments. Alessandra Sampaio, Dom's wife, said on Sunday, the day of his funeral, quote, we will redouble our struggle so that families of other journalists and environmental defenders will not have to face our pain and that of Bruno Pereira's family. We are also here to pay homage, to ask for justice for Don Phillips and Bruno Pereira and all those who were killed defending their land and territories and our environment and to reverberate Alessandra's words. We would like to thank Cristiane Fontes, Krika, for the creation and organization of this event, which is part of a series that she and the Global Canopy team has been promoting in the last years, the first one moderated by Don Phillips in 2020. We also would like to say a big thank you to the fabulous Zainab Abbas for her individual donation, and also for Greenpeace UK for their support and their team with us here today. I extend my thank you to People's Palace Projects team here in the room today. And many thanks also to Chatham House for hosting us here. We'll be together until 1 p.m. But before inviting Shai for her opening remarks, let's watch the trailer of The Territory, a Sundance Film Festival award-winning documentary about the tireless fight of the indigenous Uruwewawao people to protect their land. 
The film was shown for the first time in the UK at the Sheffield Dog Fest just last weekend. And this is actually the reason why Shai is here in the UK. She is the executive producer of the film. So let's watch the trailer. A floresta, os rios, é a nossa casa. Onde a gente se mantém. Porque o Uruê, o Uau, é como se fosse uma barreira. Tudo desmatado. Ela é, para mim, no meu ponto de vista, o coração. Não do Brasil, mas sim do planeta em geral. O sonho brasileiro de quem está vivendo aqui é ter seu pedacinho de terra para poder trabalhar, né? tirar ali o seu sustento. Produzindo alguma coisa, plantando para fazer nosso Brasil para frente. Eu mesmo falo, eu nunca vi nada de índio. Fala, ninguém nunca viu, não. É, só fala, cara. E o que eu fico revoltado é que a gente ainda é considerado bandido, pessoas que, que atrapalham o país, entendeu? A Associação dos Rebonitos diz que querem sua terra. Mas, no meu ponto de vista, eu acho que eles querem mais do que a terra. Quer acabar com o povo indígena, acabar com os isolados. A gente não vai permitir que aconteça, não. Before I start, I would like to say our premiere is in September <laughs> here. <laughs> uh, good morning, my name is Chai. I'm an indigenous activist from the Paitesri people. And unprecedented climate catastrophes are affecting people across the world, mainly women, kids, poor countries and indigenous peoples. Heat waves change in the rainfall cycle, flooding loss of biodiversity. We are seeing the largest increase in deforestation in 50 years. According to the last IPCC report, the Amazon is losing its ability to absorb carbon and help regulation the planet's climate. The Amazon is near a point not return and could become a desert. It will have disastrous effects on the climate. We had the seven warmest years in history. The oceans reached their high levels of acidity and temperature, in addition to raising sea levels due to melting of ice sheets. The climate emer emergence is real. We cannot longer ignore what has been happening. At COP26, Brazil and the world made several promises to reverse the climate change. 
the Brazilian govern government is undermining protective agents and ver environmental legislation and has expressed a desire to the end the demarcation of indigenous land, as well as opening them up to mining. Deforestation is advancing on our territories. They kill land defenders like Don Phillips, Bruno Pereira, and Ariuru Wawau, who were brutally murdered. I am afraid because my mother, my father, my husband, and my all community are receiving death threats for defending the forest like me. I wonder if you ever get shocked by what's happening in the Amazon forest. If you do, please don't close your eyes to the blood trail of deforestation, invasion, illegal mining and logging, and land grabbing and killing. If you take closer look, you will find out that the meat and leather industry connects to this treasure too. I spent most of my childhood at the Uruwawau indigenous territory. Greed and evil people destroyed parts of this land to create illegal cattle fields. Nowadays, the invaders had is estimated to be worth around 20 million years, or euros. Do you know where this meat, letter, gold are going to? To here, Europe, USA, and China. Besides that, several of our indigenous territories in the Amazon are green islands surrounded by an ocean of soil fields that are poisoning our rivers, rivers, fishes, and nature. Brazil is the world's largest use of pesticides and the list of approved ones has exponentially increased since, since 2019. During the same years, 44% of the pesticides registered there were banned in the European countries because of health toxicity. toxicity. We need Brazil to respect its promise and stop all deforestation, not only the illegal ones. We need the invasions to be removed from our lands. We need protection and justice for our defenders. We need to demarcate indigenous lands. We need you support our fight. We need a deforestation free supply chain that also respect human rights. We need sustainable development for everybody. If you think our bodies are the only ones losing life, you are wrong. By keeping this selfish individualistic and destructive system, you are also killing the Mother Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Shai, for your remarks. Um, I would like now to invite our special guests to the stage. So please, Nikki, Louise, Graham, come and join us. Um, also, I would like to say that we will be asking questions to them at this first, um, at the beginning, but then we would like to encourage your to take part in this conversation. And also you, uh, whoever is watching us online, please type your question onto the Q&A um, box. So welcome. 
<laughs> Wait for Nikki. So um, I would like to start by asking um, all of you here to say your name, your organization, and um, very briefly your main takeaway from Shai's remarks. Shall we start with you? Thank you. My name is Graham Stock. I'm a partner at Blue Bay Asset Management and also co-chair of the Investor Policy Dialogue on Deforestation, which is a collaborative engagement effort talking to governments uh, about the role we feel they should play in, in combating deforestation from an, an investor, investor perspective. Clearly, your Chai's comments are, are, are very moving, very uh, impactful, and get to the heart of, uh, of the challenge here that forest loss uh, is, is a challenge for the, for the global community, but particularly for indigenous communities in Brazil. Uh, and that's why Brazil was the first work stream that we engaged with um, in, in our collaborative effort to, to raise the issue and add the voice of the financial sector to uh, the many activists uh, and, and other members of civil society in Brazil and elsewhere who are drawing attention to the issue. Thank you. Louise? Hi, I'm Louisa Casson. I'm head of forests at Greenpeace UK. And you know, I think Chai's comments really underline how this is a common fight for all of us and how we cannot stand by and allow the impunity that criminals, that illegal mining, uh, that logging, uh, that damage and, and rollback of indigenous rights that's happening in Brazil. We cannot stand by and give that the impunity that the current Brazilian government is allowing to happen. We all have that responsibility, and I think particularly sitting here in the UK, where we have seen the global media spotlight finally shine on the harm that is being done to the Amazon, to its peoples in the recent weeks with the tragic murders of Dom and Bruno. We have to make sure that that is not seen as an isolated case, that is simply the tip of the iceberg to a long-standing problem, to daily violence and intimidation of indigenous peoples and the people working alongside them. And we have to make sure that that call for justice, for protection, for all the demands that Chai listed, that those are, you know, those are basic rights and protections. They have to be safeguarded. And as an international community, we hold that shared responsibility to make that happen as well. Excellent. Nikki. Thank you. I'm Nikki Mardas. I'm the uh, executive director of Global Canopy. And um, as Chai was speaking and as we were watching the film, I was thinking, well, that says it all. You know, all these notes, I just <laughs> throw them away. Because the, you said it all, Chai. You know, we've got this all our lives are at risk and all our lives are connected, and it emanates that risk and that connectivity from the heart of the forest. Um, and that's a big lesson, I think. And, and just mentioning the tipping point, the risk of tipping point that Carlos Nobre, eminent science scientist, point to and others point to, what an absolutely cataclysmic prospect. Um, Global Canopy works on the market side of the problem, looking at impacts and dependencies on markets. So that's the angle I'll take today, but seeing it all as part of a very deeply interconnected system. I just want to say a special thank you to all here and our partners, and especially to my colleague Krika, who's just an amazing force in bringing these events together, and all our team who support to make this possible. So thank you. OK. So I'll start with you. Um, so Global Canopy's website highlights that we are financing our way to extinction. What do you mean by that? Um, how is the, the financial sector part of the problem in terms of deforestation and human rights violation? And how could it be part of the solution? OK, I'll, I'll try and keep that brief. But, um, but maybe the briefest way is that this is where Chai said it all. You know, why financing ourselves into extinction? So extinction, why extinction? Well, we heard that before, because this is an ex existential issue for us are critical for climate. So deforestation drives 11% of global carbon emissions, the third biggest emitter after, if you took, if it were a country after China and the US, the third biggest. First, critical for nature. 80% of terrestrial biodiversity in forests, driving ecosystem services, if you like that word, that drive rainfall patterns without which we see increased drought, which hurts everybody, including the very industries that are dis destroying the forest, ironically. And that's the biggest, the drought question is the biggest of a long, scary list of what happens when you destroy nature. 
Um, and for us, the critical are, are the homes of people, as we've heard more eloquently than I can ever say. And the murders of, of, of Dom and Bruno were a searing reminder of the mortal danger that all forest defenders all around the world face every day, and one that hopefully will really strike home, not just for people who come to these meetings, but for everyone in this country and around the world to raise um, visibility on that issue. And Dom was, as was, was said, did moderate the first in this series. And with all his clarity of thinking, generosity of spirit, and huge courage, which are what we must now all bring to this existential fight. So why financing? That's why extinction. Why financing? Well, financing is just there, a proxy. It's just a code word for a shortcut for a global system of trade and finance, which has deforestation baked into it. I and mean, it's just inextricably linked into our current system of trade and finance. Two thirds of deforestation worldwide driven for agricultural expansion, for commodities, some of which were mentioned it's in our food, our fiber, our feed, our fuel, our fashion, our finance. I have another F word, which I won't say. <laughs> I thought I might, but not at Chatham House. Um, cattle in Brazil, the biggest driver, well, the biggest driver of deforestation, which I mentioned cattle, beef products, leather, the biggest driver of deforestation worldwide, certainly the biggest in, in Brazil, with our colleagues at SEI and our trace initiative, um, we track those supply chains. 80% um, of Brazilian beef goes domestically for domestic use. The remaining 20%, 1.5 million tons of export, makes Brazil the world's biggest exporter of beef, despite the fact that's 20% of production, if you can believe that. And that export is on the back of the forest. It's not all in different from deforested re regions, but it's all on the back of the forest. Soy too, you know, we've, we could talk a lot here. I mean, we, I saw this Swiss announcement on gold. Why are we even, that's not something to say, why, why were we ever taking gold from the Amazon, which is a sort of condensed, mm -hmm. you know, obscene version of what we see with cattle and soy, which are much bigger, but much more diffuse. With gold, you sort of see it. How obscene is that? And finance, so let's come to the finance. 7.1 trillion dollars going from financial institutions, investment and lending into the, every step of those supply chains, from producers, all the way through uh, the markets. A trillion in agricultural subsidies, more than a trillion in agricultural su subsidies that contribute to deforestation. So we're all sort of paying for it out of our taxpayers' pockets as well. F 40 times the finance against nature than for nature, which clearly is a massive underestimate, but there you go. So a mountain of money, and, and that's when you have to put the COP26 commitment. It's great to see 12 billion in private finance, 20 billion in overall finance committed for ending deforestation, but put that against the trillions, against the mountain of money, and it doesn't look quite so good anymore. I'm sorry, I won't be as long in, in, in following answers, but there's a lot in that, in that question. So what can the finance sector, what can people doing the right thing in this sector do? Well, finance will play a critical role in the transition to a sustainable economy to sustainable agriculture. Conversion of degraded land to productive use is critical so that there are jobs that don't destroy the environment. There's more than enough land if we converted back degraded land for food production. That needs investment. And overall, for the transition to regenerative ag agriculture over the next years, which is a huge opportunity for the finance sector. But first, and now, the finance sector needs to divorce itself from this mountain of money, that seven trillion plus, which is driving deforestation. So more important in a sense than the $20 billion pledge was another pledge that financial institutions made at COP26 with 8.7 trillion under assets under management to stop deforestation by 2025 in their portfolios related to commodities. Okay, it's a mouthful, but it's incredibly important we helped to produce a five-step roadmap for how financial institutions can do that. And critically, we made social and rights issues integral to that guidance. Because that, and only that, is what good looks like. You can get deforestation out of your own supply chains, but let the problem continue. Or you can go deforestation free, but have rights abuses. None of that works. That's not what good looks like. And we know from our Forest 500 research that we do 
looking at assessing companies and financial institutions. One third of the 500 we assess annually have nothing at all on, on rights in any of their policies. And these are the world's biggest, most exposed to deforestation. So imagine that. You know, how can you not be part of the rights story? Only one company meets all the rights commitments that we and policies that we look at. And only 4% of financial institutions have a policy on land conflicts. So you know, if deforestation is harming climate, nature, and people, and thus all of us, you know, people are at the back of the queue. And that's just not, it, it doesn't work. That, that's not acceptable. There's no, def, there's no zero deforestation. There's deforestation conversion and abuse-free finance. That's what we need to get to. And anything less is really nothing, I'm afraid. Pointing the finger to the financial sector comes my second um, question for you. Um, there is an investigation by Global Witness called Cash Cal that shows that many banks are still financing cattle ranching production in the Amazon despite the links to deforestation and land grabbing that we all know. Just to give an idea, as Nikki was saying, 70%, according to a study, 70% of what it was the Amazon forest in Brazil is now populated by cattle, just gives the, the idea of this problem. So, um, Graham, could you explain why, after many pledges and commitments with zero deforestation, this is still possible? And the second question would be, what's the pathway to change this, in your opinion? Yeah. So, uh, as, as Nikki said, the financial sector is integrated in these global supply chains and patterns of, of supply and demand that, that, that are very complex, but at the end of the day, there are financial flows underpinning them. And the reason those financial flows happen, at the risk of stating the obvious, is because, one, they're profitable for the institutions, uh, either for their clients or their, or their shareholders, and second, because they're allowed. So the regulatory environment, the legal or regulatory environment where they operate, allows those flows to occur. Now, some of that is direct. A lot of it is indirect. Um, if it's illegal activity, then almost by definition, it'll be indirect financing because the regulations in Brazil or wherever it is uh, will, will not allow the direct financing. And I think the key to, to addressing those flows and to changing those flows is to change those two aspects. So if it, if it stops being profitable, banks or asset managers uh, or governments, in the case of the subsidies, uh, will stop doing it. And that's where transparency comes into play. So the more that we know about those supply chains, where they're contaminated by deforestation and other abuses, uh, the more consumers will change their behavior, and it becomes less profitable. And the second is through the regulatory angle. So new laws in consumer countries to keep deforestation out of supply chains, because then financial institutions will respond to that, and, and their due diligence will, 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 will kick in. And, and the taxonomies in, in the countries where the financial institutions operate. Um, so the Brazilian Central Bank, for example, is developing a green taxonomy um, that would tighten the rules around lending for Brazilian financial institutions. So I think it's that twin track of reducing the profitability and, and tackling it through the, Regulation. the regulatory framework. Absolutely. We, and we know it works. We've done it before. You know, no one questions the fact that a bank, if someone walks into a bank with 10,000 pounds in cash, they're not allowed to take that deposit. They have to go through know your customer regulations, mm -hmm. due diligence, make sure it comes from a legal source. And the same should be true of, of, of financing flows to, um, to agricultural companies, to supermarkets, to whoever whoever they're lending to. OK, thank you. Luisa, he mentioned the government. And I would like to ask you that, unfortunately, we don't have anyone from the UK government here with us today. But if we had someone in this room, what would you like to discuss um, with them that, or in terms of what should be done to break this cycle of destruction in Brazil and how to turn the strong commitments on forests at COP26 into action? I think it's really critical that governments like the UK don't provide platforms for greenwash that allow this destruction to continue to you know, have that impunity and that provide these kind of veneers of legitimacy for what continues to be an economy of destruction and extermination in places like Brazil. You know, we saw with the forest deal that was very well orchestrated announcement at COP26, you know, big shiny media moment, but even 24 hours after that deal was announced, 
Boris Johnson himself was the first to critically undermine it by saying, actually, the responsibility is mainly on consumers mm -hmm. to hold companies and financial institutions to account if governments break their promises. Because we have to remember when we're talking about these commitments and promises, this is coming on the back of broken promises. You know, the, the 2020 deadline to end deforestation moved past without seeing that translate into action. So actually the Glasgow deal actually legitimizes another decade of deforestation. The forests do not have another 10 years. People living in the forest do not have those 10 years when they are facing that daily violence and that very existential risk to survival. So I think you know that sort of uh, you know hope that the the UK government had for sort of you know a nice media story really lacked the the substance, and we really just don't have time for that kind of unfocused and unenforceable deal. You know there is a reason that Bolsonaro's government felt very comfortable signing up to that deal because you know there aren't those those accountability mechanisms in there to really drive change. But also, it lacked that clear focus on the main drivers of deforestation, which, as Chai said, come down to meat consumption and meat production. And I think, you know, while we do not connect those dots and while we see the UK government willingly ignore the climate science, willing, willingly ignore even their own advisors and the sort of uh, the expertise that went into trying to produce a food strategy here into the UK, there was a clear absence there, entire absence of recognizing the critical role for meat reduction as part of tackling climate change, protecting forests, and also protecting land rights globally. So I think you know that is a, a clear sort of uh, instance where we're seeing missing leadership. So you know all those kind of warm words need to be backed up by action now. You know I think uh, we're also seeing the sort of uh, legitimising um, and kind of you know desires from the UK government to uh, you know open up a wide range of trade deals, particularly with places like Brazil, and that is hampering how much the UK government will really stand up and call out uh, you know the the kind of negligence and also the active encouragement of destruction and violence in places like the Amazon. You know, the, the Brazilian government was widely criticised for being days late, even years late, uh, in the search for Dom and Bruno. But the UK government also took several days to even comment on this. You know, particularly Dom Phillips, a British journalist, the Prime Minister took over a week to really comment on it. And again, you know, we have these very vague assurances that concerns are being raised with the Brazilian government, and yet what we see on social media from ministers are cosy photo ops as they try and negotiate a trade deal. You know, we see in the due diligence legislation that the UK government is pursuing that it is, you know, far weaker than even those efforts that are being pursued in the US or in the European Union. Um, and even again, the, the UK's own advisors, the Climate Change Committee, came out yesterday and said, you know, the, this sort of focus just on illegal deforestation that's only one step the UK government has to go beyond with a follow-up policy to eliminate uh, deforestation, whether it is legal or not. Because you know we know that in places like Brazil, that line between what is illegal and what is legal yeah. has become incredibly blurred. Uh, that actually, you know, all of this, uh, you know, we're seeing the greatest sort of legalization and particularly the sort of political and moral um, sort of green light mm -hmm. from the Bolsonaro administration to all kinds of illegal logging uh, and deforestation activities. So I think, you know, we really need to see if governments are going to sort of hold themselves up as leaders, they have to be leading to that, that kind of concrete action on the ground rather than just these sort of empty promises that risk in five, ten years as again sitting here and saying, well, you know, maybe maybe we'll stop harm in another few years. Mm -hmm. We know the harm is happening now and that's why the action has to be now. Okay. Thank you. Shai, um, I'll ask a question to Shai in Portuguese and then I can translate into English. Um, o assassinato do Don e do Bruno teve uma repercussão é, no Brasil e aqui fora enorme. É, eu gostaria de saber se, se você tem acompanhado as investigações, você fala muito de, de impunidade, se você tem acompanhado as investigações, em que pé que elas estão com relação a esse caso e outros muitos casos que a gente é, mencionou e ainda vai mencionar aqui. E na abertura hoje é, desse evento, você falou que você sente medo, né? que você sente pela sua vida, vida da sua família, você mencionou a sua mãe, é, sua comunidade. E eu queria que você falasse, dividisse com a gente um pouquinho o que, que é estar na linha de frente hoje no Brasil, defendendo 
territórios indígenas para que essas pessoas entendam o que, que isso significa. So ask now in 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 English. The murder of Don and Bruno have been receiving massive national and international attention. And I ask her if she knows what's happening in terms of the investigation now about this case and many other cases in Brazil, because as we know, that's not an isolated case now. And I ask her also, she mentioned at the beginning uh, that she fears for her life and her family's life. And I would like to ask, I asked her what it means to be at the forefront of this battle that in another event recent here, she called it um, war. Você disse, você mencionou a palavra guerra. Recentemente. Infelizmente, né, o que a gente está vivendo, o que os povos indígenas estão vivendo hoje no Brasil, é uma guerra invisível. Infelizmente, o que os povos indígenas no Brasil estão passando agora é uma guerra invisível. E ela é uma guerra invisível porque... Desde, né, o que está acontecendo na Ucrânia e outros países que têm guerra não é diferente do que está acontecendo no Brasil. Porque o que a gente vê na terra indígena Yanomamis são 20 mil garimpeiros que estão lá e que até hoje a gente não, não vê uma resposta. A gente vem sendo assassinado, como que eu disse, com o que aconteceu com o Duin, com o Bruno, e que infelizmente, como você disse no começo, não é um caso isolado. Uh, what's happening in Brazil is an invisible war because, in actual fact, it's no different to what's happening in the Ukraine. For instance, in the Yonomami territory, there were 20,000 gold miners, and nobody talks about that. What happened to Dom and Bruno, we've all heard about that, as you said, but it is pretty much a war like any other. Mas a diferença é que com a gente parece que ninguém se importa. E eu tenho medo porque o que eu vi que aconteceu com meu amigo, com Ari, e o que eu vi também que aconteceu com outros defensores do meio ambiente e dos direitos humanos que foram assassinados, é a impunidade. A única diferença entre essa guerra e o que acontece com nós é que parece que ninguém se importa com o que está acontecendo com nós. O que aconteceu com meu amigo Ari e o que aconteceu to everyone, to all of us who are getting killed. Apparently, nobody cares about that. Porque faz dois anos que Ari foi assassinado e até hoje a gente não tem resposta de nada assim como né, aconteceu com os outros também. E como no caso do Bruno, né, o que eles tentam primeiro que o próprio o próprio Bolsonaro fez é colocar a culpa nesses defensores. Mm -hmm. So Ari was murdered two years ago, and we've heard nothing about it so far. And the same thing happened to Bruno. And what we see is that the Bolsonaro administration tries to blame the defenders themselves. E eles tentam, né? O que que a polícia tentou dizer, né? Que o que aconteceu com o Bruno não tinha ninguém por trás, né? que era como se fosse um, um assassinato, enfim, que eles foram assassinados, mas que não tinha nada por trás do que estava acontecendo, que a gente sabe que é mentira. Né? O que a polícia disse foi que não havia nada por trás das mortes de Bruno e Dom. A polícia disse que eles foram simplesmente mortos, you know, it just happened. Nothing behind it, really. And we know that's a lie. A gente sabe que isso aconteceu porque eles também eram defensores daquele, daquele território. E que, na verdade, as pessoas que, que, desde a colonização, que a gente é invadido, que a gente é, é violentado e que a gente é assassinado, continua acontecendo. We know that they died precisely because they were defenders of that territory. And the same thing, basically, that's been happening since colonization, which is us getting invaded, killed, violated, is still happening to this day. E eu tenho medo porque eu tenho medo de que aconteça isso e que 
a gente também, se acontecer, saber que nada vai acontecer, na verdade. A justiça não existe para nós. E o meu maior medo é saber que essas coisas vão continuar a acontecer, vão continuar a acontecer para nós, e nada vai acontecer sobre isso. Injustice will continue to take place. It's all about impunity. Porque, na verdade, é mais do que uma omissão. O que eles estão fazendo é incentivar que as nossas terras sejam invadidas, é incentivar que a violência aumente dentro dos nossos territórios. É mais do que uma omissão. Eles estão, na verdade, encorajando o que está acontecendo. Eles estão encorajando a nossa terra a ser invadida. Eles estão encorajando a violência a ter lugar onde vivemos. Por isso que a gente vem aqui, vai nos outros países, para dizer que o desmatamento é muito mais do que árvores. A gente está falando de vidas. É por isso que eu estou aqui e é por isso que nós vamos a todos esses diferentes países, para dizer que Deforestation isn't just about trees. Deforestation is ending lives. Que quando a gente fala né, de supply chain, quando a gente fala dos produtos que estão sendo é, comprados, que, 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 que vêm do genocídio indígena, né, e que as pessoas daqui também fazem parte e também têm culpa no que está acontecendo lá. Quando we talk about supply chains, We're basically talking about indigenous genocide, and people here are also part of everything that is taking place over there. Thank you. I'd like to ask you to respond to that, and and what what can be done? It has to be briefly, so otherwise we won't have more time for um, other questions. So, do you want to start? Yes, I think, you know, particularly that, um, that lived experience of these things just continuing, that has to be broken because mm -hmm. this isn't, you know, inevitable. This is the result of a series of political and um, corporate decisions that happen every single day. And we've heard for far too long from politicians, from CEOs, that they will try and clean up their supply chains. If you aren't sure that your supply chains are clean right now, Why are you carrying on funding? If you do not have that certainty of where your products are coming from, that they are not contributing to the problem, why carry on? That needs to stop. And you know, we can talk about you know, pledges in several years' time, but we need that action now. And we need to have this as an urgent diplomatic priority from governments to raise this and to say, you know, we are so far past, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. But we need to see that urgent call at the highest levels. Graham, would you like to comment? Absolutely. I think impunity is, is a key part of the problem here. And the, the, the drop in the levels of enforcement over the last four or five years, but particularly under the Bolsonaro administration, have contributed to land grabs, to illegal mining, and, and the resulting deforestation. Um, and there are still efforts in Congress in Brazil to, to accelerate that, that, that pace of impunity um, by changing the laws around land registration, um, changing the cutoff date for Uh, legalization of tenure, uh, which currently is, is, is ending prior to 2012, but if, if, if legislation goes through uh, in the closing months of the, of the Bolsonaro administration, um, that could be brought you know, even further forward, and that's, that's just a, one more incentive for further land grabs in the future. Um, so what we're trying to do and, and what I think everyone should be doing is, is trying to pressure the politicians in Brasilia uh, in Congress. Uh, to, you know, to raise awareness around these, these, these challenges um, and, and try and dissuade them from, from passing these pieces of legislation, which I think it, it does have an impact. They are, you know, particularly a few months ahead of an election, they are mindful of the reputation risks around this. Um, you know, clearly, the Bolsonaro administration has, has done a very poor job in this regard, mm -hmm. but, but Congress in Brazil is very fragmented. There are lots of different uh, sort of currents of opinion within Congress. Um, and, and making sure that the senators, because in this case it, it's, it's possibly going through the Senate, making sure they're aware of these risks is, is key. Do you want to take the chance to talk about the investor policy dialogue on deforestation well, as you leave? Yeah, so this is one of the, one of the angles of the engagement. Um, two years ago now we wrote uh, with other investors to the, the Brazilian embassies around the world highlighting how deforestation was a risk for our portfolios. 
because of the changing rainfall patterns that it generates, the, the risks to um, Brazilian growth rates in the future, uh, and therefore to, to our chances of, of, of being paid back on the investments that we make in Brazil in, in corporate and, and sovereign bonds. And, and some of the investors in the, in the, some of the signatories of that letter are, are equity investors in Brazil and other emerging markets as well. Uh, so trying to make the case that, that the financial sector is A, aware of these challenges and also thinks the government has a role to play in, uh, a bigger role to play in, in addressing it, and, and, and trying to bring it home to them that it's a, it, it's a financial issue, mm -hmm. not just for foreign investors, but for Brazilian investors as well. And we have, we have Brazilian investors in the group too. Um, and we've been talking a lot to the government over the last two years which might surprise people. You know, does the Bolsonaro administration even want to talk about these issues? But yes, they do, or some people do in the administration. We've had very good uh, contact with the governor of the central bank, the new environment minister, ministers of agriculture, infrastructure. And for sure, they don't necessarily agree with what we're saying, but they take it on board. And, and I think it, it, it at least colors the, the dialogue that's going on within the government and, and hopefully in Brasilia as well, in Congress. And also we've been talking to, to, to civil society um, and trying to add our voice to, you know, to those raising their concerns around these issues. Um, now, has it been successful? Well, no. You know, fires are going up. So far this year, the, the number of fires in the Amazon is, is up 19% year on year, and, and, and the last two or three years have been terrible as well. Um, but we haven't seen new legislation passed, which would have made things even worse. So you know, we're, not, we're not claiming credit for that, but at least that's one positive. And data is still available on the, on, on the numbers of fires and the pace of deforestation, which is another key ask that, 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 that data be available. It could definitely be improved, and we're still pushing for more transparency around supply chains, traceability of, of cattle and soy and other products that are contaminated by deforestation. Um, but the, the dialogue is ongoing, uh, and not just in Brazil. We have a work stream also talking to Indonesia, and we just launched a third work stream to talk to the governments of uh, consumer countries, so the UK, the EU, the US, uh, and China, to urge them to, again, change legislation, make, make deforestation a, um, yeah. something that has to be kept out of supply chains at all costs. And that, and that you know, regulation, as I said before, has a key, play to, a key role to play in this. Thank you, Nikki. Just going back, thank you, going back to Shai's comments, um, she holds everybody's accountable. Here, yeah, so. well, rightly, rightly so. And, and the impunity when you can't see or you don't want to see, yes, absolutely, of course. So what can we do? Well, what the others have said, but leveraging, I, we think we have to leverage the power of, mm -hmm. power, of, power of markets. So what Graham has described, what the IPDD, this group that is pressuring the government are doing, that's financial muscle pointing in the right direction with close-up engagement. So we really commend that. And what we need to see is not the 8.7 trillion that have committed to actually do something. And they are doing something. And we met with some of them yesterday who signed that commitment. So that 8.7 trillion, though, pales in insignificance next to the 130 trillion committed for GFANS, the group that are moving on net zero. But there's no net zero without action on deforestation. So we need you know, 130 trillion worth of grams, not 8 trillion worth of grams. We need an order of magnitude rise there. And yesterday, we were at an event. Some of us, Chai gave a very moving and powerful talk to an event on, uh, coordinated by the COP champions. And Mary Shapiro, the former chair of the SEC, was there making this point about this agenda and saying, you know, now in the GFAN's net zero guidance for financial institutions, there's at least a reference in the, in the huge guidance on transition requiring tackling deforestation. But we need to get out of the big documents, as, as Louisa said, and into, into real action. I mean, I would be a little, I'm, I'm less down on the UK government than, than Louise is, I, I've got to say. I don't think it's all. Um, just one big media story. I think the UK has actually done a lot. Is the government full of outrageous paradox and outrageous failures? Absolutely, uh, outrageous. But they have created, there are brilliant people working within the system, creating political space that is, must then be converted. And we're seeing now laws in the UK coming in, 
in the EU. Are they enough? No. Are they a massive step? Potentially, yes, that can then be strengthened. These laws, I think we'd all agree, are absolutely essential. And of course, so is reducing consumption. Of course, all the things. And thank goodness you're holding them to account. Um, so all of those things are critical. But for me, as individuals, what can we do? I mean, we, we do have to change our lifestyles, but we also have to exert leverage. So you know, as individuals, as consumers, you know, please put your, I sometimes talk at schools, and I say to the 10-year-old you know, kids at the supermarket, go and say, is, thank you for all the, is it driving deforestation? Is this linked to deforestation? Mm -hmm. Do you know it's not driving deforestation? That's an awkward question from a child. So please, uh, you know, you don't need to ask your children to do it. They're probably asking you to do it. Um, so let's all, let's all do that. As pension holders, we did some work with Make My Money Matter, 20% of brilliant group working on sustainable pensions. 20% of UK pension funds are driving deforestation. That's pretty crazy. It's your money. It's our money. Talk to them. That's crazy. Make my money matter. Say that's the biggest thing we can all do. And finally, as voters, you know, but more than as voters, as political activists. I mean, that's the, where make my money are wrong. I think you know the one thing we can do better than that is taking this in our hands and going against the lobbying that is going on to make those laws weaker with our, all our voices in a in a very active way. So we we need all of that. Talking about supermarket, it's my next question to um, Shai. Um, because her organization, together with national and international NGOs, are suing supermarket, the French supermarket casino, over alleged links to deforestation. Uh, and I'll ask her about the status of this action and if she's planning to, to planning other actions similar to this and Shai. Um, o Nick estava falando do supermercado e o supermercado e perguntar se aquela carne que você está comprando é, é proveniente da destruição de uma floresta. É, eu queria te perguntar é, sobre o processo, a ação que vocês estão movendo contra o supermercado, o grupo de supermercado Cassino. E qual um que pacta essa ação e se vocês estão planejando fazer outras ações similares? First, I would like to say congratulations because one thing that uh, I think is necessary and you don't do here is uh, teach your kids, you know. In, in, in my land, we, I, I, I learned uh, that uh, the importance to the forest, the importance uh, to the, we live in the harmony, So uh, the people here, uh, como é que é Rio? River. Rio, uh, não, Dero Risada. Uh, laugh. Laugh, <laughs> but I think it's, it's a good thing to do. You need to teach your kids about the forest. You need to, to teach your kids about uh, the importance, uh, the life, and this thing. You know, so. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> the, the only difference is that here our kids are teaching us. They're way ahead of us. They're way ahead of us. So, yeah. Okay. And are you trying to speak English because it's so difficult to me thinking, stopping, and return <laughs> to thinking again to translation, okay? Uh, so if you don't stand, just levant a mão. Okay? Thank you. Uh, so is the the casino case is about the land that I I I say in my speech um, and I think it's a very important uh, case because this is an example to to the other countries and to the other place too. Uh, now we are. Um, a gente não vou saber como é que fala. A gente está. É... Esqueci em português agora até. <risos> uh... Esse caso é importante porque. Sim. A gente está. É... We are discut discutting with, with them uh, para fazer um acordo. acordo. To come to an agreement. É, to come to agreement. Uh, to because you know they they are uh, support the 
our genocide, support the destruction in our land. And it's very easy uh, to, to do an excuse always. <laughs> the, the governments, the, the companies never uh, can do uh, monitoring. So, but uh, uh, how we can, how we can uh, discover this, how we can uh, know uh, to dismiss this going to, and the government and the company can not do this. So they, they can, but they just don't want. And, but I, I was talking with this case with Krika uh, because I think it's very important to, to uh, I example to the others, but to we construction a case in Brazil too because uh, they need to, um, I esqueci as palavras tudo. Quando a gente, a gente esqueci. É, they need, to, they need, um, I forgot the, the, the word in Portuguese, you believe that? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> uh, é, quando a pessoa... Você tem que construir um caso? Não, eles têm que... Esqueci, mas tá. Ok, I will remember. Uh, but now we are construction uh, in a case in Brazil to remove this cattle there. Because this is important too. Not only uh, they pay uh, for what they, they do, they did in our land. This is important too. And I think uh, uh, um, a discussion very important that we are do, doing with them is uh, that they they need uh, include the what the, the impact in the community, not only the impact in, in the environmental, but what the, the impact to community they did. We are. We are talking about the people, we are talking about the lives, and there in this place is a, a sagrado? Sacred. To the Uruguay people, because mm -hmm. uh, there is a cemetery. So uh, they need um, receive to this impact too. And yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll go to you, Luisa, again. Um, many scientists suggest that we should have a moratorium um, on deforestation. This is an interesting question for you as well. In the Amazon now, and particularly in new frontiers and where the land rights were not secured to the local and traditional communities yet. Many others say this wouldn't be possible, uh, efficient or beneficial for Brazil's economy. What's your take on it? Well, I think we need to look at who is arguing from each side, who is saying this would not be beneficial, what do they mean by who is that going to be benefiting? Mm -hmm. You know, I think we heard from Chai at the start these demands of we have to stop all deforestation, we have to demarcate lands. So we can't kind of separate these into different kind of policy asks, I think, and particularly where those land rights have not been secured or they are under threat, that is also a priority. I think that, you know, halting that, ex that in expansion of agriculture, particularly that that is serving industrial meat, is a priority because we already know we are facing so many problems. So that halting of the expansion is key. Uh, but that you know we have to have that combination, that whole agenda of how do we you know underline and respect and fully enforce human rights and land rights, as well as protecting the environment. This isn't you know a, a kind of we can't have these silver bullets. Uh, so you know we need this whole agenda and this concerted political energy to do that. There are some key policies, but they have to be working together, and that has to be lasting. There has to, you know, that has to be something that is not temporary. It's only a, a trial. We have to see that real commitment that is going to that is going to last over years. Okay, thank you, Gray. And you, you mentioned before that uh, about profit. A lot of people are making money out of 
you know, um, deforestation as well as legal um, use of the land. So my question, I don't know if it's a naive question, but how to make money at all for positive change in Brazil, talking specifically about Brazil. Are the opportunities out there currently? Or? There, there are. Um, the challenge is scalability. So, so there are alternatives. I was at a conference in, in Brazil a month ago where there were lots of green finance initiatives being, being touted. Um, the government was launching its carbon trading market, which I think is, is, is quite badly flawed. But alongside that, there, there were um, proposals for you know, circular economy ideas, um, uh, carbon capture, um, and, and, and more sustainable agriculture ideas in, in brownfield sites rather than newly deforested sites. And coming back to whether you know, it, it would be damaging to the economy to impose a moratorium, I don't think it would at all. The, the yields on, on cleared land are terrible. In, in the last 13 years that we've got data for, cleared land contributed less than 0.01% to GDP. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense from a financial point of view for the economy as a whole to, to, to clear forest. Um, at the individual level, there are incentives. You know, you, if, you, if you have nothing to live on, then a little bit is, is, is better. Uh, and so it's changing those incentives. But I, mean, I would challenge your assumption that people are making a lot of money out of deforestation. I think people are making a lot of money further up the supply chains mm -hmm. out, of, out of the... Uh, you know, yeah, the, 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 mar the, mar the margins grow as you get further and further away from the actual deforestation. The deforestation itself is, is not a particularly profitable enterprise, which, which is also why there's so much illegal activity around that, mm -hmm. because it's a way of laundering the proceeds of, of drug trafficking and other, uh, other, other crimes, you know, illegal gold mining, et cetera. Um, so so it's, you know, enforcement plays a big role here. But, but the economic incentives uh, you know, certainly need to be addressed. OK. Nikki, any comment on that? Well, I mean, maybe I could talk a bit about the, just this, this, the reality of getting to this finance sector commitment and whether, you know, what, what will it take? Because this sort of mix of realities and incentives on the ground is all a big part of that. And I think, you know, because we have got this very ambitious target for 2025, so how are we going to see that take place? How are we going to see that happening? Is it possible? I mean, technically and theoretically, it certainly is possible. We've come out with a roadmap on deforestation-free finance, which is stepwise, you know, what we call challenging but doable. You know, we, we've got very big companies making progress on deforestation. Unilever and Nestle, some may have seen as their CEOs were in the FT yesterday making a common position on deforestation. There is some progress there. But the group, you know, and then there's the group really getting stuck in, sort of making, making good progress, as we've heard. So, so theoretically, yes. And because of all these incentive systems, yes, we can get there. But in reality, you know, we've seen it's a no. I mean, we're, we're, we're not getting there. We're, that's evident to, to all of us. We had 32 financial institutions make these commitments at COP26 with fanfare, rightly so. But there have been two more since COP26. So in the last six months, we've seen just two more be added to the list, and it isn't, isn't the very biggest ones. So you know, only one bank, you know, the banking sector, is currently missing, absent from these commitments. So at this rate, no. And yesterday we published some new research, which was a, a new report showing that of the companies most exposed to deforestation, only nine are making real progress. Even Libra and Nestle are among those nine, showing you know, how we can make progress, whatever their challenges and flaws. But that means 90% of companies with the very biggest exposure to deforestation are going to miss their net zero targets at this rate on account of deforestation. So I mean, we, we seem to know, you know why we need to do this, the who, the how, but we don't seem to have it in, in, in the system. I and mean, this goes back, I think, to Chai's point. You know, what, what do we not see? We don't seem to have it in us to do this. And, and Nigel Topping, the high-level climate champion who hosted yesterday's event, quoted a thoughtful business leader who, who said, are we, are we idiots or are we cowards? 
you know, and, and I think given the conundrum that has been described here by everyone and best of all by Chai, you know, that's a pretty valid question. And I remember at an event we, many of us were together at, at COP26, Juma Shipaya, an indigenous leader, said so powerfully, what is it you don't understand? You know, what is it you don't, you're not getting here? So, which I think goes to the heart of what was being said before. So, can we make it? Yes. Will we make it? Doesn't look like it. What do we need? Well, a tiny speck of nature, the coronavirus, you know, and, and we know pandemics are linked to habitat, you know, zoonotic diseases that are linked to the destruction of habitats. So it's all connected. But that crisis did speak to markets in a language that markets understand. You know, trillions of dollars in impacts, millions of lives lost, and forests will speak that language to us if we see a tipping point. But they should be speaking, you know, of the savannization of the Amazon, this horror, like utter horror story. But the horror story is happening now. It's, it's happening now. We're just choosing not to see it, or markets are not choosing to see it. So, I mean, I have some thoughts on where the priorities are, but maybe I've said enough for now. Okay. Talking about priorities, Shai, back to you now. Um, a gente tem eleições daqui a pouquinho e as pesquisas estão indicando uma mudança de governo. Eu queria ouvir de você é, quais são as prioridades que você apontaria para o próximo governo. So I'm asking her about the priorities of the next government if there is a change of government that the polls are showing. What would be the priorities for the new government in Brazil? And I, I just want to pitakan a pergunta anterior. to say some things about the last question that you you can uh, finance and support our fight too. Uh, we are not uh, are just the um, defenders of the forest. We are planting and producing uh, sustainable products in our lands. And why you uh, continue to support the companies that do um, uh, illegal things and not support us that are uh, working with the carbon, working with the uh, sustainable products, working with uh, a bio economy? Why? <laughs> you can do this. <laughs> And, but uh, um, yeah, the, I think it's very important we understand that the environment, the climate change need be, uh, it's not only about uh, our parties, uh, it's about all the government, all the parts need to talk about that. And, not not uh, only one candidate or one ex ex specific uh, person. All them need to uh, talk about that because it's it's about our future. Uh, and but I think a uh, priority uh, is the people. In Brazil, the people are starving. The people are dying. Uh, we have a more a desemprego, unemployment, unemployment, uh, and Brazil need to do um, contrary, the opposite, the opposite that they are doing now. Mm -hmm. They need be uh, law more stronger. They need uh, be the uh, the organ protection or, uh, agencies more strong to, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to demarcate the indigenous lands. And to the, the, the next uh, election, I think it's very important to say that we are doing a campaign to indigenous candidates because we need to not only change this, uh, the president, but we need to change the Congress too because they will continue to decide to what's important to them. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to, uh, to do a different solutions. We need to 
have a different Congress, and the Brazil needs vote in indigenous women and black women and LGBTQI, and yes, uh, but I think. I think it's important we say uh, that the deforestation in Brazil is not legal. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not legal. It's always illegal. <laughs> so we need to end the deforestation in Brazil, uh, but start to think uh, in human rights. Mm -hmm. I think the first point is the people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think we have now a chance to get um, questions from the audience. And also, uh, for those watching us um, online, just type your questions on the Q&A box. Someone will be um, reading these questions aloud. And there is a microphone. So whoever wants to start, just raise your hands, and they will come with the microphone. Just wait for the microphone to come I to ask, you. I Do you? Oh. Just a second. I, I should answer Chai's <laughs> question about why we don't uh, oh, invest in indigenous uh, food projects and so on, because it's, it's really important, and, and I think it's worth, it's worth explaining. So we, it's easy to throw around huge numbers about what the financial sector manages or represents, you know, hundreds of trillions of dollars. Most of that sits in bank deposits in the country of the, of the, the bank and household, and then, then is lent out in that same country. Almost all the rest of it is managed under very tight mandates. So our investors, our clients at, at Blue Bay Asset Management, to use, to use my firm's example, they don't give us a pot of money and say, go out and make 3% for us, or go out and make 10%. They, they say, we want you to invest this pot in, say, US equities. We don't actually do equities, but they might say US equities. Manage this pot against emerging market sovereign bonds, in which case we can buy government bonds issued by Mexico and Brazil and South Africa and so on. Um, but we're not allowed to then take that money and invest in US government bonds. So, and everything is very tightly managed like that. So there are two people that can make asset managers change what they're doing. One is the client, and the other is the regulator. But we, as managers, we have very little freedom to say, no, I really like that, uh, you know, that project there that's exploring ecosystem services in in Rondonia. It, it, it's, so how it, it do just, we change that so they can, well, they can see that it's... That, that won't change, I don't think. I don't think that can change because, mm. because the, invest, the clients, the pension funds, your, your pension funds, they want to know what risk they're running when they give us the assets to manage. Mm -hmm. they, they, so they, they, they limit our freedom for maneuver very closely. Uh, but where, where finance can flow is, is more at the more grassroots level. So uh, from cooperatives in Brazil, from uh, ESG funds in Brazil, they're going to be much better equipped to assess the risks around these projects than, than we can be from London. So I, I personally, and, and this isn't something that we've, we've done much work on, but I, I very much doubt that cross-border capital is going to be the answer here. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be domestic financial flows from people who understand uh, the, the, the domestic situation and can go and visit these projects. I mean, it would be, it would be irresponsible of me to invest in in, in, in something like that without, you know, without spending time on the ground, getting to know the people involved. The, the, minimum, the minimum size for a bond that we can buy in our portfolios, whether corporate or sovereign, is $500 million. It's, it's huge. Mm -hmm. so, so we're not talking about microfinance here. We're talking about big companies and, and governments. And that's, that's the starting point. Now, other investors might have a mandate for those uh, sort of more startup projects, but they're still quite small in the big scale of things. So I'm sorry. I I'm wish, sure she I would, wish, she, I, she I would wish, like to answer I wish that. I could. OK, uh, so I, I understand that uh, it's more profitable. It's more profitable? Profitable. Uh, continue to invest in distribution. It's, it's not so pre profitable, profitable to invest in the, the, in the, in the protection yeah. in the forest. Mm -hmm. Is that? No, it's not. <laughs> so, so it's not about the profitability. It's about, it's about what our clients allow us to do. So, so, so Nikki's point about make my money count, 
those are the people we need to talk to. Mm -hmm. the, the, the pension fund managers, pension fund administrators, and the, pension, the, the, the workers who are contributing to pension funds, they need to put pressure on their pension funds, which, are, which I think is unlikely. They, they would need to say to them, we, we don't want you to chase returns for a better retirement. We want you to make a difference in the Amazon. And that's not, that's not what the financial system does. Philanthropy does that. So, so people who want to donate do that. But that's, uh, that's different. Yeah, I understand. But I, I don't want to donate. We are doing a good work there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we need to change this. And, uh, and we need to talk to your client and say to them two things that the Amazon it's uh, we can do money with the Amazon and the second thing is uh, the uh, his money don't have value if you don't have life no absolutely <laughs> absolutely yeah, so, yeah. I, I completely agree with that, but I think, I think we'll get more traction talking to Brazilian investors who can understand what's going on on the ground better than, than foreign investors can. So that, that, I think that should be the starting point, and then, then that can be scalable, because then you can show, you know, look, there's, there's this Brazilian fund is making, making returns and doing good. Why don't we invest in that Brazilian fund, because they have the expertise, we don't, and then that grows from there. But it's very difficult to start it from London or New York or... Yeah. A consultancy to the indigenous people yeah. might be very <laughs> helpful. Um, so whoever is um, raising hands, there are a lot of questions from the audience. Oh, hi, yes. Just, just on this issue that you're talking, you know, and the, 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 the amount of investment that is needed, you know, but, you know, it has to be a large investment. But I think in that sense, you are prioritized in terms of agriculture. You are prioritizing like a, a big producers. I, I mean, uh, in, in sense of speaking of Brazil, uh, you prioritize large landowners, monoculture, all this, all this system of uh, farming that is harmful for the country. And as we saw in the trailer of uh, the territory, um, basically, you have these small producers uh, wanting to do land reform on indigenous land, while you have in Brazil a large concentration of land. And uh, I mean, it is my impression, and you can confirm if, uh, if I'm wrong, that the financial system, especially in Brazil, when you're talking about foreign money, uh, in Brazil prioritize these large landowners, the large agricultural companies. And a lot of this land is, is, as some of you, time only mentioned it more at the beginning, it's not just cattle, it's soya, okay? And it's not just the Amazon, it's the Cerrado with soya. And, and we've seen a, a, a boom here, I don't know if it's in other countries as well, of, okay, yeah, be vegan, yeah, be vegan, but then buy this, 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 all this new crap that is made out of soya. 100% soya, so, you know, be vegan, eat some beans, think of something else if you want to be vegan, or eat a piece of meat a week, so but don't, the, don't have who is the question for? fake yeah. burgers of soya. Oh, oh, just the question, so, so is it not the, the issue that then you, uh, the season should change from supporting these large agriculture projects to smaller agriculture projects? I mean, despite what you said, I can understand about that, but in the sense you, you're keeping the system as it is. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, but it's, it's economies of scale. So, um, different actors within the financial sector will have appetite for making small loans. And, and we're talking about small loans. We're talking about you know, a few hundred reais, a few thousand reais to small producers compared to a big producer issuing a bond for, for 500, 500 million dollars. So, it's a, it, it's a different scale and therefore it's a different group of investors that we're talking about here. Um, and that's why I mean, that's why I say cooperatives, microfinance, you know, those are the, the actors that are more likely to be able to finance the small scale producers. But it doesn't mean, so, so we're not prioritizing big producers, it's just that they're the only ones trying to borrow enough to make it part of our remit, if you like. But we don't, we don't have to invest, we don't, and we don't. If, if, you know, if we, in our due diligence, if we identify deforestation risk in their supply chains or in their activities, then we, we don't participate. We don't lend to those. Someone else might, but 
but, but we certainly don't. And that's how the, the, you know, the ESG process, the due diligence, is expressed in, in, in financial sector lending decisions. I think it will be interesting to hear the Greenpeace response to that. Yeah, I think, you know, when we hear the kind of financial language around sort of well, what risks are being run, we're hearing today, and we've heard many, many times before, that those risks are deforestation, genocides of indigenous people. So I think there is, you know, that strong role for regulators, but also those involved in the finance sector to be thinking, how do things need to change? Because as you said, we cannot carry on with business as usual. Business as usual is fundamentally broken. And so we have to take that challenge and think, how can things be changed? And again, recognize where these are decisions that are being made mm -hmm. and systems are held up by the decisions and the policies that are there. Those can be changed if there is the will to do so and to experiment to do things differently. You know, I think the kind of the withdrawing of finance is incredibly important. There's a lot to learn from the climate movement of withdrawing from fossil fuel investments. But you know, that kind of same level of scrutiny on the food side is not yet there. We know that many big banks, Barclays in the UK and others, are still pouring billions into big meat companies like JBS, mm -hmm. whose net zero plan has been shown that 97% of their emissions, there's no plan to reduce 97% of emissions, even though you know, a year ago they said, we have a plan to go net zero. Again, you know, playing the, sort of, the media, the circus, and saying, you know, we've got a headline, look, we're trying to do something. But that deeper scrutiny shows that you know, that is not a plan. Uh, you know, there is no evidence of deep decarbonization measures there and commitment. That has to have consequences. And I think that's a real theme from today, is that question about accountability and consequences, and those that's falling now so that we're not waiting for another cycle of broken promises. Thank you. Is there more question from loads of people raised hands before? Hi, I'm Patrick Abraham from the Climate Change Committee. Um, you kind of touched on it more broadly, but to any of the panelists, what would be the concrete steps that you want to see from the government in this area with Brazil in the next year? Would you like to say, Nikki? Sure. Um, I mean, I think we really now need to see a delivery of a strong due diligence law. I mean, that, you know, there are many, many other things that we need to see, but this is on the table. It's, it's in the Environment Act. It's now going through consultation for the second phase where the detail will be hammered out, and that detail is critically, critically important. So I think real, you know, that sort of application of rules to a big consumer market and the EU, a much bigger, even bigger consumer market that is moving towards similar legislation in a slightly different form, but nevertheless, they're both going in, an, in, a, in a good direction. I mean, that's, I think, the thing we need to immediately see over the line. I mean, because it's, it's there, it's, it's for the taking, and it can be diluted by lobbies who are trying to dilute it or it can be held strong that will make a colossal difference because it will leverage all this consumer power, not just in disclosure, but in actual due diligence, which is a higher level um, of scrutiny. So you know, I think that's, I'd say, the most important thing that we can get right today. Finance is not covered in either, or is not foreseen to be covered, the finance sector, by either the UK or the EU processes, and by the way, you know, we're seeing the beginnings, sap seedlings of this happening in the US, where it's much more complicated. In China, there's some work, so this needs to spread. But now in the UK and the EU, you know, the government's own group that set up to advise said that finance should be included. Finance sector is outside of that. There are lots of other measures going on with the finance sector that we need to see become regulation. So, yeah, I think that kind of regulation is extremely important, and it's within grasp. And it's not perfect, but it's a hell of a lot better than what we've got. Thank you. Who's next? Hi. Thank you so much. I have a question about risk, because you were both talking on the financial aspect of things. You talk about risk. So I wonder if this risk is the way risks are measured and estimated is something that could change as well. When you talk about financial risk and an investor not wanting to see the profit in investing, for example, in indigenous community, why don't we try to change that kind of way of measuring things, incorporating rights, what is all connected? Why don't this change? 
in a way. And how is, and then also I was curious about your roadmap, if you could just summarize it in a very layman terms, so we kind of understand a little bit more about it. Thank you. Uh, it, it is changing. So we are incorporating those risks more than we used to. It's not perfect by any means. There's a long way to go. But 10 years ago, there was no requirement on funds to disclose their climate exposure, for example, or to measure the carbon intensity of their portfolios. And now we do have to report that to our clients and to the, to the regulators. And there are more things that could be brought into that net, but it is, it is changing all the time. And in, in economic terms, this is about incorporating the externalities. So, so making, uh, you, make, making it clear what the costs are to the planet, to indigenous peoples, to other groups. Uh, of, of these activities, whether it's fossil fuel extraction or deforestation or, or, or any, any other harmful activity. So, so those risks are being better captured now than they were, but there's lots more work to be done. Um, oh. Do you mean the, ro the roadmap that I, that I mentioned? Well, I mean, you know, it follows a fairly sort of mundane, you know, set of steps which, which need to happen, which are replicated in lots of other domains, which are, you know, assess and understand, take this seriously at board level, assess and understand your risk exposure by, you know, doing a proper evaluation of materiality and issue and risk and exposure, make commitments and policies in place that lay out your stall because, you know, yes, commitments are just commit, make them science-based commitments, science-based targets, and engage on that basis with companies that you invest in. And that's an incredibly important piece of the puzzle, is this engagement and laying out a stall through a policy that says, OK, this is our intent. So be, you know, let's avoid doubt here. You, we, we expect you to do this, not to do that. You know, laying out that stall and following up on it with active engagement is incredibly, incredibly important You know, than taking actions in line with your plan, and finally disclose and be transparent. Report back on what you're doing, because if you don't disclose and you're not transparent, then how is anyone to know or trust what you're, what you're doing? So the roadmap itself is you know, not rocket science, but it's, it, it is founded on the best available science. And one thing just to say on that is, yes, transparency is a massive issue. Data is an issue. Everything's an issue. But there is enough. We, we know that the leaders can do this. So if everyone followed in what is currently the best available data, and it will continue to improve, we will see a big change, a massive change. You know, it won't be perfect, but it'll be a big change. So really, there shouldn't be any excuses for an action. First of all, thank you. I wouldn't be happy to be sitting where you two are, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, well, I just wanted to think one thing you said about uh, the trillions and the millions. And I think many NGOs here are funding grassroots organizations, and grassroots organizations themselves are raising some funds to be here to do something. But as if there is a will, there is a way, the funding need to get to these people because NGOs in this country, in Europe, funding these organizations, we're not going to get there. It's less than peanuts. It's less than cents. You know, we need to, to find a way. If it's not with this, with that, we need to find a way. If if it's too tight here, how we gonna? You know, like I think we need to create something before all the people agree that we cannot carry on the way it is. So I really would invite you to say, what could be done? What are the ways? And, in, and another question as well is in relation to the burden that organizations like indigenous organizations have to take to prove that uh, there is illegal gold. Like every now when we try to do some advocacy here, they say, prove it. How can I put on this burden on leaders that are today fighting a health crisis, because malaria in the Yanomami territory is just killing. If you see the photos, you'll be shocked. We don't publish these photos anymore. 
I think it's immoral to say it, because, but it is happening. So how we can convince companies, um, stakeholders, and everyone that we cannot put the burden to prove the crime on the victim, on the dead, is totally unfair. And we need to do something about it. So it's to you my question. What do you think can be done? Which kind of influence we can make to people to change that is the murder that need to say, murder by the back to say who, who killed them? And today we have so many cases in Brazil where we are this, trying to sort this Yanomami illegal gold mining. Everyone say, you need to prove that we are buying illegal gold. So gold comes from a region where there is no mine concession, no concession, photos, Greenpeace, WWF, full of photos of open uh, gold pit. And people ask us, where? Well, you need to prove. So again, what you cannot, people don't understand. So I just wanted to hear from you, how you that talk to these people, powerful, how we can make this conversation less burdensome for some small links in the chain. Graham. I, I, I think the burden, the proof is already reached. I mean, no, I don't think anyone disagrees that these terrible things are happening. Oh, well, there may be some denial in Brazil and denial of responsibility, but, but, it, but, but the, the information is out there, as you say. There's no doubt about that. And I think, I think it's a misconception to think that, that financial institutions in this country or elsewhere are financing that activity directly. Now, they may be financing it indirectly, deforestation in particular, for, for, for crops. And what we're trying to achieve is a degree of transparency so that it's obvious that it's happening and then it stops being indirect, it becomes direct, and it stops. That's, that's, what, that's where we're trying to get to. Um, but at, at, in, in terms of what can change, again, there are two groups of people who, change, who can change it. One is the governments that we elect, so we need to elect governments that want to address this challenge. And the others are the consumers, the clients who, the consumers of, of, of the produce and the clients who who invest, and that's, and that's all of us. So uh, as, as Nikki said, you know, people should be asking their pension providers or their financial, financial advisors, you know, what, what are you investing in? And choosing the, 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 the products that are uh, focused more on impact and on uh, particularly the, the, best, the best in class ESG products. Not just, you know, often there are ESG labels that don't actually make very much difference to the investment process, but the best in class ESG products that actually um, your channel, channel resources to the positive projects rather than just avoiding the, the negative ones. I think we have a question right from um, online. Yes, um, there's quite a few that have been covered already, but this is a follow-on um, from what's being discussed at the moment. If through due diligence one financial institution rejects a client, then that client will simply look for other institutions who are willing to invest. How should this be addressed from our online viewers? Um, that can happen, but then there's a, there's a reputation risk for whoever it is that takes on that client. Uh, and so if the, if the regulatory environment is, is, is strong enough and the publicity works, it should, you, know, you, you should get an improvement in, in practice. It's a, I mean, it's a concern around fossil fuels, for example. If, if everyone divests from, uh, from coal mining, com from publicly listed companies that own coal mines, the coal mines will end up in the hands of privately, of privately held companies. They'll still dig the coal out of the ground and it'll still get burned, but there'll be less scrutiny, less engagement, less supervision. Now, maybe that's still better than it being in, 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 in our pensions, but the, you can debate that. And, and it's the same with, with clients. But the more transparency, the more light it, that is shone on this, the more questions people ask about what, you know, what, what funds and, and banks are doing, the, the, the cleaner it will become. Is there another one? No. Um, there, there is. Um, yeah. Okay. Do you want to? Shall we go back to the audience and then we have one more from online? Hi. Thank you. I think just a little bit. I've been working with the finance sector at the global level for over a decade now, trying to explain the importance of the forest. I think Graham said something really important here. Uh, there is a lot of attention on the global investors, the global banks. I think the attention needs to be expanded to the local investors. Uh, I've been to Brazil 
eight, well, four years ago, and I started talking to some uh, financial institutions there about deforestation, was completely out of the radar. They could not understand deforestation was an issue. Of course, what they, the increase was very slow, uh, and corruption was the, the top of the agenda of the financial sector. Fire came, we saw what we saw in 2019, and if there is anything positive from that, is that the financial sector in Brazil now is a little bit more aware that there is a problem, that the international market is looking. So I think one thing as I, I ask for, for everyone who is here is try to explain a little bit more and focus a little bit more as well on the local financial institutions. I think would be my, my advice. I think it's changing a little bit. We, as Graham mentioned, you know there is an increasing number now becoming more involved in the agenda, but there is a lot to be done with the local financial sector in Brazil. So I think it's more, rather than a question, more an advice for all the NGOs who are here in this room and for you as well, Shai. And I would love to talk to you after to see how we can do it together. Yeah. Okay. I'll do the next question. Thank you. Fiona Cladra, I'm the former regional ambassador for Latin America and Caribbean for COP26. Um, the panel and indeed many of, of the questioners have, have really outlined many of the challenges, many of the difficulties of this agenda. Um, but my question really relates to um, practicalities and the urgency of the situation. And going back to the point raised by others, what can be done so that we're not here in a year's time having exactly the same conversation? I'm also interested to understand how can we build more on uh, developing knowledge of the economics of biodiversity and turn this into a win-win for both governments, for indigenous people, uh, for business, for wider society. So I'd be very interested to hear the panel's thoughts on that. Thank you. Would like to go for it. The, the, it's I mean, the, the great challenge is that these processes move slowly. Your regulatory changes, like legal changes, move slowly, and and the crisis is urgent, as 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 we've heard and as we all know. So I don't have an easy answer to that, except more pressure. So more pressure on on governments here to, to tighten up these due diligence laws and implement them quickly, extend it to the financial sector, because I think, I think that is important, um, and, then, and then pressure in, in country um, to, to improve policy. Now, that, you know, the, the election in Brazil in October maybe presents an opportunity for, for better policy, but even then, there's tremendous inertia. It'll take time to build back up the capacity in, in, uh, in enforcement in, in the environment agencies and the uh, justice ministry and so on. Um, but, but I think there, you know, th there could be some grounds for optimism there. But it, it, there, isn't, there isn't a quick fix. In terms of valuing biodiversity services and channeling investment into those, uh, again, I think there, you know, there is some work, some progress being made, but it, 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 again, it takes time to scale those up. Um, but the, you know, there, are, there, are, the, there is good work being done. There's good work being done on valuing um, biodiversity and biodiversity loss and then that can be incorporated into, in, into portfolios as well. Um, not so easy to channel the finance, but at least to, to, you know, to externalize those costs, and then that, that shapes the way, the way finance flows as well. But, but I don't think there is a quick fix, unfortunately, and that's what we need. We're run out, running out of time, but would, you would like to comment on uh, that. If you'd like to go first. Yeah, uh, sure. So I think, you know, looking at the hooks that we have established already and holding those to account. So one of the most significant things to come out of Glasgow was governments recognizing they can't come back every five years to increase their pledges for what they're going to do. It has to be every year. We're now seven months on from that which governments are coming forward. So that's something that everyone can do, whichever country you're based in, to pressure governments to step up that ambition and particularly to put the food system and agriculture within those national pledges because that's a huge gap as well and we know that drives deforestation. Nikki. Yeah, I just just on that question about by the way, I just wanted to say, you know, the, this question of, you know, looking at the financial system risks, impact impacts and dependencies on nature. The bit that is not understood well for the finance sector is dependence on nature. And that could be a huge unlocker of 
action playing to the drivers that motivate the financial sector. And right now, we did some research years ago with uh, UN agencies that said 50% is used a lot, that says 50% of the global economy is dependent on nature. You know, the WEF said that using that research. Obviously, that's a huge under, I mean, everything's dependent on, on, on nature, not 50%. But the question is, where's the granularity in that? Where are the dependencies? You know, and this is an interesting report by Climate Tracker showing, you know, reliance on rainfall in the Amazon is, is, is you know, getting more drought is reducing yields and reducing yields on investments in, in some of the soy that has been opened up, you know. And that's a set of economic drivers. If we understood them better, we would see capital flowing in a better direction. So I think there's a huge amount of research and work to be done on the understanding, the science and the politics of dependence on nature and beginning to unlock more, you know, the trillions that, you know, okay, I use these big numbers freely because I'm not in the finance sector, but, you know, the trillions that are needed for a transition to regenerative agriculture, even at a large scale, not just at a small scale, at a large scale, that transition needs to happen. But I, I think starting with dependence on nature and opportunities is really important. Thank you. Um, I would like to finish the session with um, Shai doing your last remarks about that. After what, everything you've heard here today, uh, if you would like to comment to, to close our event. Pode ser em português, se quiser. E a Patrícia traduz o que você preferir. Não, vou falar em inglês mesmo, porque o que eu falei, que aí eu penso, aí eu paro, aí quando eu vou voltar, já 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 perdi a minha linha de raciocínio. Ok. É, first, I would like to thank you, Krika, for inviting me to this this event, uh, I think is very important. Uh, we be here today, discussion about what's happened in the Amazon, what's happened in in our territories, and how this af affect you too. Because uh, you say uh, the people don't understand yet. Uh, uh, the force is all, all is connected, and we need understand that. We need understand that if you don't do something now, uh, maybe when you realize it's so late. And but I. I will uh, looking for your client <laughs> to talk to 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 him and the others too. Uh, I think you, you need to stop uh, to excuse and to promise and do. And I will show you to my work, my my people work with um, coffee. And we um, we uh, ganhamos uh, ganhamos o quê? Prêmios. Win awards. Win awards. A lot of awards. The best coffee. So you know, it's not a donation. We are doing a very good work uh, and sustainable work. And, but I would you like to invite all you to this fight, a fight for life, not only my life, not only my, my fight, it's your too. And all the world need, um, need change this. We can change this. We have more power than them. You know, but we need to understand that too. So uh, I think I would like to thank you um, all, all the table <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, and I think is is that. <laughs> thank you. Thank
Yeah, that, I think we came too close now, one, one o'clock. Thank you very much, Graham, Louise, Nikki, and Shai, and Patricia for your support as well. And thank, thank you everyone who came here today. And to those who are watching, I believe the recording will be uh, available shortly, yeah? And there are all the events taking place here today at Chatham House. I don't know, they said they would put up um, this, yeah, the schedule is there. So have a look, and I think the conversation keeps on going, because there are so many questions unanswered yet that we should be um, discussing about. Thank you so much. <laughs>